without further ado, please make some noise for Philippe. Hi, everyone. Thanks a lot. Uh, do I need the handheld? Or? OK, cool. Uh, thanks, everyone. I am Philippe, and thanks for that uh, intro, Ramel. Uh, so yeah, I am a storyteller. I tell stories. Um, I get to tell stories for a living, which is really cool, but there's kind of a blurry line between what I do for work and play. As Ramel mentioned, I love to travel and go places, so whenever I go somewhere, I love to make videos about things that just uh, capture my curiosity. I've done this with everything from Thai food to mezcal to more serious topics like world poverty. Uh, but I also like to work with organizations focused on climate and social justice, because I think the power of storytelling can really amplify the good they're doing. I'm going to tell some stories from that part of my world in just a little bit, but I kind of like to think of the stories I tell as, the, as a, here we go, as, there we are, the opposite of watching the news. Um, so I have nothing against the news. You uh, need a free press to have a functioning society, or so I've been told. But you know the way you feel after watching the news? Like, throw some words at me. How do you feel after watching the news? Depressed. Depressed? Depressed. <laughs> well, like, all came at one voice. Yeah. Like, uh, anxious, anyone? Yeah. Cynical. Cynical. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Helpless. Uh, I thought I heard that. <laughs> but um, disenfranchised. Wow. So yeah, there's something about watching the news that makes you kind of feel like the world is chaotic and you're just a, an observer to all of it. And you're also unable to do anything about it, right? I like the stories I tell to feel the opposite way. First, I want, it, want people to hear my stories to feel like the world is way more complex than can fit into a single narrative. I also want people to feel like we're not just passive observers. We literally overcome ridiculous odds to get the miracle of life. And we're not just going to sit by and watch this whole thing happen to us through screens and um, on the news or through radio waves. No, we get an invitation to be participants. What's kind of ironic about this is I actually wanted to be a journalist at first. I went to high school. I wanted to go to school, study journalism, and then go do badass things on the front lines of war zones, like on the field reporting. And I, I, I went to school. I went to UC Santa Barbara. I got there, and I discovered they had no journalism program. Like, you, you would have thought I would have looked this up before applying and <laughs> accepting, but I didn't. So I was stuck with, what do I do now? I saw they had a film school, so I started going there. I actually also kind of wanted to act and, and be on screen. As a Filipino kid back then, though, I never saw anyone who looked like me on screen. So the plan was to maybe start behind the camera and then gradually start sneaking in front of it. Um, and the only problem with this plan was that film school was weird. <laughs> Did anyone go to film school? I expected to see a couple hands. I, you, hopefully, you had a totally different experience than I did, or just like the things that my program did. But my school was so philosophical and theoretical, uh, which I now appreciate has value. But I went there wanting to make movies. And they wanted me to write essays, analyzing the crap out of these like obscure artsy French films from the 1960s. Uh, and it was so abstract and not hands-on in the least. I remember going to lecture one day. and. All we were doing in lecture was watching avant-garde videos. Avant-garde film means that for lecture, they would just throw on the, uh, on the big screen of a lecture hall a video of, of, of childbirth. And that was, that was class that day. <laughs> that was so weird for me, being in class and watching that. I imagine it was even weirder for the guy who came to class late and tried to sneak in the back with zero context for what was happening on screen. <laughs> so I left film school. I left the country, actually, after I was like, this isn't for me. I'm going to go uh, study abroad and just do that, because at least I know I'm, I'm probably going to like that. And I was right. Um, I went to Italy and Argentina, which are two easy places to fall in love with. Uh, but I really fall in love with the whole thing of being elsewhere. Right? It's not just the food and the sightseeing, although that's a lot of fun, but it's being around different cultures, people who think differently, who see the world differently. It's being challenged to reinvestigate the way I see the world and my expectations. And I think, hey, I want to do this for the rest of school, or better yet, the rest of my life. I find another major, a new thing to focus on, called international studies. It seems ideal. It's right there in the name, international studies. Hopefully, it's not a bait and switch like I thought film school ended up being. But uh, no, this time, it was right on the money. Uh, I saw things that stuck with me. I learned things that were really eye-opening, some of which were uh, kind of pretty upsetting, to be honest. I remember being in class and, and watching documentaries. I think this is probably why I'm such a believer in storytelling, and I especially love video. 
And I saw documentaries on things like the Rwandan genocide or the crisis in Darfur. And I was so bothered by uh, child soldiers in particular. I, I think that, that those images still stick in my mind, like the idea that kids as young as 10 or 11 were being uh, kidnapped from their villages and, and forced to, um, you know, being psychologically manipulated, then being brought back to their villages to do horrific things to their own families. Like, I decided there that after seeing those things, I wanted a career in international human rights. I didn't even know that was a thing at the time, but I just wanted to make sure that that stuff would stop happening. So I graduated, and I felt like the thing I actually needed was a little more experience to start doing this thing. So I start saying yes to every volunteer opportunity to go abroad, every internship with an organization that came my way, to getting a master's degree. Here's some of the places that brought me. Uh, I did this internship with a really cool organization called Liberty in North Korea that uh, rescued and resettled North Korean refugees. I'm hearing some whoops, so I'm thinking some people have heard of this uh, org before. They're really cool. I did a master's thesis studying life in one of South Africa's most violent neighborhoods, um, really investigating what it was like to grow up there. I spent time in this refugee camp in uh, northern Thailand. Uh, I even got to visit the actual DMZ, which was pretty wild. And as I'm seeing places and getting to see things up close, this is the lesson that stands out to me. There's always more to the story. And this is why I was particularly excited about the theme of depth, because when you take this phrase, there's more to the story, and you apply it to all kinds of areas in our world and in your lives, that changes everything. You're going to hear me say that a bunch. There's always more to the story. So as I'm traveling, I'm realizing there's so much more to the story of other people in other places than these simplified, reduced narratives that we often get, than these stereotypes we're familiar with. And you only realize that when you move closer, when you choose proximity. I love the word proximity. It just means moving in close. You know? And let me tell you some examples of this based on uh, the things I saw. When it comes to North Korea, right, you always hear about nukes and quirky dictators. These are like the two storylines that uh, the media or whatever is obsessed with with North Korea. But there are 25 million other North Koreans, people like my man Joseph. Uh, this is a picture I took when we were hanging out. We were like back in our mid-20s at this point, and he's building his first set of Legos. The uh, reason why this stands out to me is like peak Lego age for me was like 9, 10. And uh, at that, roughly that age of life, his world was totally different. That was right around the time where his dad starved to death, where he was separated from his mom and his sister, and when he ended up ultimately leaving North Korea. Seeing that juxtaposition was like, we had such different lives, such different worlds. And at the same time, we're bonding over this thing of Legos like we have so much in common at the same time. Um, in South Africa, right, this was a neighborhood called Hillbrow, uh, a particularly violent area. Before I went there, I tried to look up some information online to see you know, what I would need to know before going there. And I found nothing helpful because all everything said was, don't go there. That's just the part of town to avoid. And what I found were some guys who taught me what it really looked like to grow up having each other's backs. They taught me about solidarity. Uh, and then in Thailand, right, I went to this refugee camp thinking I would see temporary makeshift shelters. And what I found was a whole city. Uh, these um, refugees escaping uh, Myanmar had come to Thailand and had nowhere else to live for decades. They were confined to this camp, and so they made it work. They built their own uh, schools and churches, marketplaces and restaurants. There was a men's choir. Like This place was teeming with life. And there was suffering in all these places for sure. But there was also hope. There was also life. There were also further stories happening. And I love this quote by Brene Brown. People are hard to hate up close, move in. And I think you can remix this a little bit. People are hard to reduce up close. People are hard to stereotype up close, to oversimplify. People are hard to ignore up close. And when you move in close, you see that suffering and that heartbreak more vividly. You really feel it. But you also see what else there is to the story. You see life. In many cases, you see hope. I'm now convinced that hope and heartbreak in the world pretty much always coexist, and it's just hard to see both at the same time, but they're almost always both there. It's kind of like, uh, like this. Um, is there anyone who does not remember this? I'm like fighting two things. On one hand, this was like the most viral thing ever. And on the other hand, it's like 10 years old at this point. So if, okay, if anyone needs a quick refresher, this is a dress that like took the internet by storm. And half the world was like, that's a white and gold dress for sure. And the other half was like, no, that is a black and green dress. 
And then there were these enlightened people, right? Who are like, well, no, okay, I see how it can be white and gold, but if I move back, it's black and I have no idea why the enlightened person is Dracula, but, um, <laughs> but some people can see it both ways. And I feel like your brain kind of like can't, for whatever reason, see them both at the same time, but you can toggle, you can shift and see them both. And I kind of think hope and heartbreak are like that in the world. <laughs> I'm gonna switch slides before I start too many debates in the crowd. But here's someone who I think said it a little better than I just did with that dress example, and it's St. Oscar Romero from El Salvador. He said, there are many things that can only be seen through eyes that have cried. And the way to see these things is to move in close and to choose proximity. So after moving around the world for a bit, you know, I didn't want to just keep doing the sampler platter of human rights. I actually wanted to commit to something for the long haul. So I joined this team called Plant with Purpose. Uh, Plant with Purpose is this uh, organization based here in San Diego. If you haven't heard of them, check them out. But I, I was excited because they work on two of the world's most urgent issues at the same time, which is poverty and climate change. And these are really at the root of so many uh, other issues around the world, including some that I had gotten familiar with. I actually like their model a lot, it's threefold. First of all, poverty and climate are so interlinked, I don't think you can holistically address one without at least making inroads against the other, you know? Uh, Plant with Purpose brings this third dimension to it. It's a Christian organization. It was really important to me that it was uh, inclusive and would work with anybody, but I love this aspect of spiritual renewal because it wasn't just about planting trees, it wasn't just about helping people have more money, those are great at the end of the day, but it was really about healing relationships, relationships between people and the earth, people and each other, people and creator. And so I'm pretty thrilled to start working uh, with this team that I feel so aligned with, I'm excited that it's international in context, uh, but I do feel like a rookie, particularly when it comes to the climate science stuff, right? Like I loved the outdoors, but I never took an environmental science class or anything. So I kind of felt like I had some catching up to do. I started asking people, what do I need to read? What do I need to study? You know, if you know a great TED talk, send it my way, because I need to sound like I know what I'm talking about here if I'm gonna be working here. I say, the best thing you could do actually is to go. Plant with Purpose works in communities around the world that are basically the front lines of climate change, places that are most vulnerable to the impacts of, of climate change. And so I start, I take people's advice and I go, Tanzania, Thailand, Haiti, Burundi, Mexico, a handful of other places. And sure enough, seeing things up close, that proximity makes things make sense. One of the first things I learned is that poverty is really rural. Uh, my mental image had always been of slums and places like Johannesburg that I'd gotten familiar with, but around the world, of, for every 10 people who are living in poverty, eight of them are living in a rural and remote village. And at first that sounds just kind of like, okay, a, like a Snapple cap fact or something, but here's why that's important. When that's your lifestyle, you grow your own food and that's what you feed your family. Uh, if there's any extra you sell out at the market, that's your income. Uh, about 800 million people around the world live this way. It used to be like the whole world pretty much. And climate change is messing with people's ability to do just that. When people can't put food on the table, uh, they resort to desperate things, right? Uh, some people might uh, start using sketchy for, uh, chemicals to try and fertilize their farms and get better crop yields. Other people might even burn an entire field, which sounds counterintuitive, but what you're actually doing is just kind of trying to clear more surface area to work with because you just need food that badly. Uh, over time though, the soil takes a hit, of course. Damaged soil can't support plant growth as well. So in the long run, that food insecurity gets even worse. Damaged soil also releases carbon back into the atmosphere, and so climate change is getting worse, and you can kind of see how this is a, a downward spiral. Uh, this stat always blows my mind, and it's that around the world, about half of the soils are considered degraded. Like, half the soil. If you think about how important that soil is, this is like the soil that gave way to human evolution, that was like, you know, what civilization emerged out of, and half of it is damaged right now. This is a photo from uh, earlier this year on a trip I went to to Burundi, but this kind of ties it all together. You're, you're driving around, you see a lot of fields that used to be forests, but now are just open places full of tree stumps. Now, a big part of the reason why this happens is because of charcoal. It's talking about how uh, desperate conditions lead to desperate actions. Well, charcoal is something you can sell and make quick cash from. You see a lot of sacks of them on the side of the road. Uh, and people resort to this oftentimes when they feel they have no other way. People know this is bad for the land. It's not um, that awareness that they're lacking necessarily. It's other options. 
I met this guy, Antoine, and as we passed by, he was actively burning charcoal in his kiln. Started talking to him, and he told me, yeah, every three years, he would have to clear the trees from this area, turn it into charcoal, and look, for a long time, I always linked deforestation in my mind with like these greedy businessmen wearing like gold chains with cigars and stuff. I'm sure that exists in some places, but in a lot of other places, it's just people like Antoine, who's not the supervillain. He just wants to put food on the table. He said it in his own words, I just gotta feed my family. He doesn't wanna be in the position where folks like Enos in Burundi or Ellie in Tanzania have found themselves. They just have to tell their kids like, hey, I don't know what we're gonna eat today. We might just have to skip, skip food today. Something, something no parent ever wants to have to experience. The good news to all this is that there's a solution. Actually, there's a lot of solutions. You know, I think a lot of people are hoping that the big solution for climate change is some technological innovation that just still needs to be invented, but there's actually plenty of solutions that exist that can heal the soil, sequester carbon right now, and it's a matter of investing in them, teaching them, scaling them up, and um, organizing them among people, right? And so Plant With Purpose invests heavily in a lot of these. Things like regenerative agriculture, uh, learning how to compost your soil, learning why you should diversify your crops, how to minimize soil tillage, like this, all these practices that when put together bring health back to the soil and help people grow more food. Planting trees is a huge part of that. Uh, there's a method of planting trees I'm particularly fond of called agroforestry. Uh, the long story short version of that is you integrate planting trees with uh, the farmland underneath with the crops that grow and you get good relationships between them. Trees provide shade for the crops so they're not withering in the sun right away. They're attracting moisture in the air and the ground, they're protecting the groundwater. They go deep and sometimes pull nutrients that are way down so that cr smaller crops can get to them. They also protect those nutrients from being washed away by soil runoff and erosion. And Plant With Purpose is teaching these skills in different communities. And at the, the end result is that Enos, it's been a really long time since he's had to skip a meal, right? He told me he now eats three meals a day, which is a stat I've heard before, but when I actually saw that with his family in front of him, uh, and his kids, there's four in there, I think he has five kids total, but I was like, that's actually, that's a lot of mouths to feed. This isn't three meals a day for one person, this is three meals a day for a large family. That's coming a really long ways from having to skip meals sometimes. Uh, Ellie also made progress. She was able to move her kids into a new house. There's her old house there and her kids, and this is where they're living now. Big improvement, stable structure, pretty cool furniture. Um, I especially love that her new house is right next to her old house, so she uses the old house as a laundry room. But it reminds me that progress is possible. And I'm actually a climate optimist, which I know is something you don't hear too often. There's some technical reasons behind that too. I could nerd out about, actually, you know what, I, I'm just humor me for a sec. I'm gonna bring up the graphs. Uh, you know, carbon emissions per capita in the US is like moving back down. You know, it was rising for a long time, but we're actually now doing better on a per person level than we were in the year 2000, which is something you definitely don't hear too often. This is likely to pick up because the cost of clean energy is plummeting at the same time that it's getting way more popular. Two of the biggest pieces of climate legislation in my life were just passed in like the past two months. One of them happened like the other week and hardly anyone reported on it, but it's gonna phase out the most dangerous uh, greenhouse gas probably uh, in the near future. This chart particularly has me excited. You know, you always hear sometimes that we need to be behind, below 1.5 degrees of, of climate change and we're not near that target and all that is true. But scientists used to see us on this trajectory towards like four to five degrees, which is, I don't think we can even fathom the level of like uh, catastrophe that that is, right? And because of changes in policy and in behavior and in societal and cultural norms, we've moved it. Uh, this is also an outdated graph, you know? This came out after last year, around last year's COP26, and we moved there, and I think some of those big laws have pulled it down closer to two degrees. Still not enough, still not enough, but it shows me that a, movement is possible, and also in that gap between that blue line and the peak of that red explosion over there, those are countless species, countless ecosystems, countless lives being changed. It's a dynamic story, it's not, the outcome's not set in stone, and that's what I like to remind us of. Uh, but at the end of the day, these aren't the reasons why I'm a climate optimist necessarily, they're just kind of like sauce on top. Uh, real reason I, I've, 
found some hope and optimism is that I've met people like Enos and Ellie. You know, without that proximity, I don't think I would be anywhere near as concerned about the impacts of climate change. I've seen what it can do to a family and just how much uh, devastation it brings. But I also would not be anywhere near as hopeful. I think if they can find hope in some of the most climate vulnerable places in the world, I ought to give it a shot too. Climate change can be a scary thing. And I'm not trying to invalidate fears and anxieties. I think both these things can coexist. There's a, there's a lot of good reasons for, for concern, for climate anxiety in the world. There's a lot of other scary things in the world too. You know, we can get like really philosophical about this, but I often think a lot of the instability we are all experiencing right now is kind of related to all the changes we're seeing in the world at once. Uh, it's happening at a fast rate and you know, technology makes it more visible. And that brings up a lot of uncertainty and a lot of unknown things. Change is uncertain. Maybe it turns out good, but maybe not. And people respond to uncertainty in so many different ways. A lot of them are unhealthy, which is, I think you see a lot of that right now. But what if we chose curiosity instead? I like to define curiosity this way. You know, I used to think curiosity was just like, ooh, I wonder about this, I wonder about this, let me go investigate. But I think in the, when you zoom out, curiosity is really a healthy relationship with the unknown. Because you're always gonna have unknown things in your life. How can you learn how to get comfortable with it? To remember that there's always more to the story. There's more to the story of our world than the statistics or the headlines can ever tell us. What would happen if we choose curiosity? Now, climate has been the area where I've been working in for some time, but you know, there's certainly a lot of other areas where this applies to, right? Um, gun violence, racial injustice, Anything that really breaks your heart that you see. And you know what, it's not just the global issues. Like those are big and those can weigh heavy sometimes, but what if it's a more personal thing? It isn't like everyone going through something in some way, right? There's likely an area in your life where you just need to stop, take a minute, and remind yourself there's more to the story. Let me share with you the time that that happened in my life, the time that I most needed that reminder. There's a picture of my wife and I. We met in college. Uh, we got married in 2015. Uh, and then here is our first Valentine's Day as a married couple. Not what I was expecting. Um, we're in a hospital. I don't know if you can tell by the stuff in the background, but we're in a hospital in Portland. Deanna was born with a, a genetic illness that made her really susceptible to lung infections. And for the first several years that I knew her, uh, I kind of knew about it, but it was always in the background. It was well managed, but this was my rude awakening. This was a big wake up call. She got this really bad lung infection that sent her lung capacity down to 22%, which is like transplant territory. Now, it kind of threw a bucket of cold water on our expectations for the next few years, on our hopes to become parents and all that. We actually had a doctor tell us like he didn't know about her, her recovery trajectory, let alone our, our intentions to try and have kids. Like this guy's bedside manner was terrible, but he also wasn't wrong. Um, amazingly, Deanna got better. She's one of the strongest and most resilient people you will ever meet. And so she recovered, she got out of the hospital and stuff by no small miracle. Uh, but the story continues. A year and a half after that, some change, I end up going to Haiti. Haiti is a lot like the countries I talked about earlier, severely deforested. Actually, as you're flying in there, you can already see how bad it is. The ground was like gray and chalky, looked super hard. The ground looked like concrete, but it was actually soil. Like, and people were supposed to grow food from this. It's like, how are you supposed to garden the sidewalk? This doesn't make sense. Uh, but I meet some people who confirm that, yeah, it really is that bad. Jernita up here tells me that this is a country where you don't reap what you sow because nothing grows. And Raymond tells me how it has such bad infrastructure. His, his brother was killed in a car accident and he developed a drinking problem after getting severely depressed. Duela told me how the international community responded. A lot of people were shuttled into these tents and she said they were kind of, when they were put in line, they were just left to shove each other around like animals. It was a really dehumanizing experience the way a lot of aid was implemented in Haiti. Uh, Niall gave me insight into life as a farmer there. He'd start his work at 5 a.m. He'd work till 7 p.m. So these are 14 hour days. At the end of it, he told me how much he earned. When I did the math in my head converting the currency, it was, it was 33 cents from 14 hours of work. Now, 
They were telling me these stories of some of the hardest moments in their lives. And all of this was right around 2010, 2011. And the reason why that struck me was that was about the time where my Plant With Purpose teammates in Haiti, I have a, a local staff there, was laying the groundwork to enter and begin work in this community. And it's called Fon Verret. And it reminded me of that the thing I was saying earlier, how hope and heartbreak almost always exist at the same time. In fact, they quite literally existed at the same time. These solutions were being developed. They hadn't been implemented yet. At the same time, these people were at their hardest moments. If they could just hang in there, not give up, keep taking, moving steps forward, and, and, and be ready. That would make a world of difference. They did, and we are so glad they did. Today, Fon Verret has one of the few intact pine forests in Haiti. Uh, later that day, after hearing everyone's story, I, I took a walk in that forest. It was behind the lodge where we were staying. And I already explained to you that I was, I'm a, a spiritual person, so I kind of felt this whisper as I was walking there, like, I did not forget these folks in their hardest moments. I'm not forgetting you and yours. They were seen. You are seen. And that was exactly what I needed to hear at that time. So I mentioned Deanna got better, uh, and we did start trying to have a kid. We, we pulled the goalie, we uh, started, and, and nothing happened which was no big deal, right? Like sometimes it just takes, takes a little while uh, and stuff. But not only did nothing happen, she started getting sick again. Actually, three times that year, she got sick enough to need IV antibiotics, um, which you would help her get better, but you can't keep doing that over and over again. Like your body will develop a resistance to those treatments, and it's not a sustainable solution. Uh, it made me really scared to think of what that meant for our hopes to become parents, for the next few years of our life and what that might look like. It made me so scared I didn't even want to think beyond those next few years of, of what that might mean or what that could look like. You know, I used to think that hope was being in a tough situation and being to say, things are going to work out. It's going to get better. Like, everything's OK in the end. And I no longer think that. Like, I think that could be optimism. And that can be a good or helpful thing for a lot of people. But I think hope is something else. I think you can actually be super pessimistic and still be a hopeful person. It, it sounds strange, but I think hope is more about what you do. Mariam Kaba says hope is a discipline, right? And so I think of the farmer who plants a tree, even though she's living in the most deforested country on earth, and I see that as an act of hope. I think of a lot of people I work with in this climate space. Uh, most are not as optimistic as I am. Um, and yet, I think of people who show up to do the work anyways because they think it matters. And I think that's an act of hope. I think you can think you're, fight, you're fighting a losing battle, but if you show up and fight anyways, I think that's hope. At the end of the day, I think hope is where you plant your feet. There's more to the story of our lives. There's more going on than what intrusive thoughts tell us, than what our feelings lead us to believe then we're capable of knowing at any given moment. We gotta choose hope. So Duela and, or, um, Jernita and Raymond now, they're leaders of purpose groups. They're leading environmental change and stewardship in their communities. And Duela is too. Uh, actually, now she plants like hundreds of trees every year and most of them she plants in memory of people lost in the earthquake in her community. Niel. Niall would not tell me his new salary, but he did tell me that he employs 14 people, so I take it it's gone up from 33 cents. These are people who chose hope, who didn't go give up, who planted their feet instead, and who saw change. And you know, our, our lives continue to be up and down. Uh, they actually moved in a more chaotic direction in some ways. She broke her leg, our housing fell through, we had to figure things out at the last minute. And doesn't it always happen when you least expect it? If you've never, <laughs> if you've never seen an ultrasound smile, I zoomed in. <laughs> and a few months after that, our man Reese was born. Now, there's always more to the story. This exact same week, the FDA approves a new drug that treats the underlying cause of Deanna's lung infection. This is basically a miracle drug. 
The research for it began back in the 80s, actually the same year my wife was born, and it culminated in the release of this drug the week my son was born. I was literally in the hospital room reading the press release on Twitter, reading the conversation, and just scrolling being like, this, is this too good to be true? Like the things that people are saying, the studies and everything, this is incredible if, if true. It was true. It changed so many things for us that only 18 months later, <laughs> so now I have three kids under the age of three and my life is ridiculous, <laughs> but I love it. And every time I feel lost or that weight of the world or that uncertainty, I kind of remind myself that there's always more to the story and how glad I am that I didn't throw in the towel too early, that I chose hope, that I chose curiosity. There's always more to the story. There's more to the story of our world, of people and places, than the simple narratives we often hear, than the stereotypes or, or the, yeah, reduced storylines. There's more to the story of our world than the statistics or headlines can get across. There's more to the story of our lives than we can ever know in any one minute. You gotta choose proximity, choose curiosity, and choose hope. And I think these things go hand in hand because there's always more to the story. Thank you all so much.